I uh, come from the Applied Physics Department at the Hebrew University, and I will talk about improving or boosting adiabatic protocols uh, with uh, two ingredients, inertial evolution and optimal control. So, um, as we all know, computation in a noisy environment is challenging, and there are many things you can do about it. About it. And I will focus, as I said, on adiabatic computation and optimal control. So, quite generally, in adiabatic uh, uh, computation, we take some system, a Hamiltonian, we change it slowly, and uh, assuming that we do it slowly enough, the system clings to its instantaneous eigenstate, and we can basically design the system in a way that this eigenstate encodes a solution to some interesting computational problem. So, this is a a big idea, basically, and there are many protocols out there. There are many things you can do adiabatically. For example, you can do a robust manipulation of a two-level atom, and you can do more complicated things, like uh, do a, an adiabatic Grover search algorithm, teleportation, or solve even a KSAT problems. So this sounds great, and the problem is that uh, if you want to do things adiabatically, you need to do it slowly. And the question is, how slowly? And the, the bad news for adiabatic uh, quantum computation is that you need to do that the scaling of the duration it takes to do things adiabatically scales unfavorably with the system size. So, um, so that is a problem. And it turns out that if you want to solve very large uh, computational problems adiabatically, you'd need to do it very, very slowly. So maybe that's not so helpful uh, with this uh, uh, if you want to keep and do things adiabatically. So what can you do about that? So uh, an important idea was introduced by Michael Berry in 2007, and he basically introduced a concept called shortcut to adiabaticity. So in this paper, um, this paper says that if you add some control fields that counteract non-adiabatic transitions, you can do things more quickly. So this, uh, on, in theory, sounds uh, perfect. You can basically take a pen and pencil, like, pen and paper and write down a, a perfect analytic solution that is both robust and fast. But the challenge is that, um, that it's not so easy to implement in practice. <laughs> and here you can show that these terms that you need to add sometimes require um, uh, input power that is too large or scales badly again with system size. So the, the uh, challenge of adiabatic protocols translates into the challenge here in applying these additional control fields. Um, so this is um, a, still a subject of a recent, uh, there's a lot of progress even in recent years on how to improve um, SDA or how to improve adiabatic protocols to make them actually practical solutions to large problems. Um, so um, one of the very um, powerful tools for improving uh, algorithms is optimal control. Um, and with that, I just want to mention specifically some recent works that add um, adiabatic constraints to optimal control. So um, you, you can you know, ask a computer what is the optimal protocol that will perform a certain task, and then you can impose um, conditions on your um, optimization algorithm to minimize non-adiabatic jumps. So this is kind of in the spirit of what we're doing. That's why I mentioned it. And there are very recent papers where people try to um, um, apply these ideas to things like variational quantum algorithms and uh, approximate optimization. So today, I will show you our solution, our feasible optimal solutions for several specific adiabatic protocols. So that's the, the topic. And <clears throat> with that, let me proceed and say, what are the two main ingredients that go into our approach. So the first, let me check if I can point. No. Oh, OK. OK, so the first thing we use is something called inertial evolution. So this, there's a relatively recent paper by, um, by uh, Ronnie Kozlov sitting in this audience that he calls the inertial theorem. And the idea is that you don't need to do things slowly in order to be robust. In some sense, you just need to accelerate slowly. So he ha this is a nice idea because basically he says you can achieve the same robustness as adiabatic protocols without being adiabatic. So that's nice. In a more in mathematical terms, you, you need to find, you take some, some Hamiltonian, some system, it's rapidly changing, but now you're trying to look for a new basis to do a basis transformation and transform your system into uh, a different basis where now the Hamiltonian is nearly stationary. Okay? And to give you an example from that, from a, for, for this idea from classical mechanics, you can look at this pilot here, and the pilot has a, min a mission. His goal is to drink water from a cup while he's, he's doing a loop. 
and he wants the water not to spill. And basically, th this works. Okay, you can drink and the water doesn't spill. And the reason it doesn't is because although the pilot is clearly accelerating very rapidly with respect to the floor, he's going in a loop, the acceleration is in the perpendicular direction. But in order to spill the water, um, there is no acceleration in the direction parallel to the surface of the water. So the reference frame that he chose is very good for this purpose, and the water doesn't spill. So this is classical mechanics. But let's give you um, an example from quantum mechanics. So here's the idea in quantum mechanics. Let's say we have this um, random problem of manipulating a qubit. Um, so our Hamiltonian is some superposition of uh, you know, x and z Pauli matrices. And a and b are coefficients that vary rapidly. So what can we do about that? You can basically introduce two new operators. So you introduce this operator L, which is another combination of these uh, x and z Pauli matrices, but it's orthogonal in some sense. And this complementary operator, C, um, this omega is just the geometric mean of these a and b. And what happens now is that if you write down the dynamics uh, for the operators of h, l, and c, so you just write the Heisenberg equations of motion for these operators, you get something, this, this form. But what you see, this mu is a parameter defined over here. It's the adiabaticity parameter. But basically, this is very convenient. If you, you can basically renormalize the time coordinate, get rid of this omega, and you find that as long as this mu is varying slowly, uh, the dynamics is adiabatic. So this is the idea of Ferroni and Roy's work. And the point here is that this mu does not have to be small. It just needs to vary slowly. So mu defined here is something like the time derivative of the control fields. If it varies slowly, it means that the second order derivatives of the control fields needs to be small not the first order derivative. So without the math again, the idea is that maybe we don't need to do things slowly, just accelerate slowly, and maybe we could find faster product protocols. So this is idea number one. And idea number two is just optimal control. So basically, uh, so the second ingredient is just optimal control. So in optimal control, we're looking for the optimal fields, and we're doing that by constructing a, a functional, and we're looking for some we, we start with some guest control fields and then evolve the system, compute the, um, the cost function, and update the guess with a computer. And basically, what we do in this work is we introduce inertial and adiabatic constraints. And we use these inertial solutions as a starting guess for optimal control. And we can show that this has an advantage. So oops, so OK. It just no. OK, yep. All right. So um, yeah, so specifically here, I wrote you know, the, the standard function of quantum optimal control. So we want to reach a certain target. Say we want to satisfy the right dynamics. And we want to have a limited amount of power in our, our pulses. This is standard. And what I wrote here schematically, although this is not the only thing we do, but I schematically wrote down that we also want to constrain the rate of change of the control fields and the second derivative. So we're playing around with this kind of constraints. And let me show you what we get. OK? All right, so from this point on, I will just show you some protocols that we optimize. Um, OK. All right, so the first protocol we, I want to show you is basically improving stirrup. OK, so stirrup is an adiabatic protocol for transferring population between two ground states of an atomic system. And so we have, so uh, between two low energy states, uh, so say we have an atom with energy levels you know, 0, 1, and 2, and we want to transition population from this state to that state um, via an excited state without ever populating the state 2. So Sierra protocol is an adiabatic protocol, so it is based on adiabatic following, okay? adiabatic following of the dark state. The protocol works in the following way. So initially, in this protocol, initially 0 is the dark state. We initialize the system here, and we make sure that this is the dark state. In the end of the protocol, 1 will be the dark state. And in order to do that, what we do is we first apply this field, omega 1. And if we apply omega 1, then 0 is dark. Then we gradually dim. We, we shut off omega 1. We turn on <coughs> omega 0. And then the system reaches state 1. So this is the protocol. And so 
let's say, to, to be more specific, let's um, write, introduce a parameterization for the field. So we can call them you know, a sine and a cosine of some angle. And in order to transition from 0 to 1, we want this angle to be 0 initially. So only omega 1 is on and pi over 2 in the end. So only omega 0 is on. OK, so this is stir up. Now, in order to do things adiabatically, we need the derivative of theta to be small. But in order for it to be inertial, we only need the second order derivative of theta to be small. This is kind of what I told you in the previous slide. And there's also a condition on in the derivative of theta. So, so in, in, there's a very large body of literature on optimizing <laughs> such protocols. But what is lacking in the current literature is some theory for a theoretical criterion for why to choose the optimal fields and optimal pulse shapes. And this kind of gives you uh, a criterion that we checked. And it's actually, when you go and check what are the optimal curves from the literature, you see that they kind of satisfy this. So we were happy about these criterions and criteria. And we used them to search for optimal solutions. So let me show you what we get for stir up. So what you see in these plots is the infidelity by how much the, by how much the stir up protocol missed the target state as a function of protocol duration. And this is the robustness. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. So basically, as we make the protocol longer for a fixed input power, we're more adiabatic. So we compare here several pulse shapes, uh, standard Gaussian pulses, some op well-known optimal pulses from the literature, and our um, solution that we find by solving these uh, criteria that I showed you. And you see that our protocol performs well. Basically, we, we can get a very nice uh, a results when we just uh, satisfy these conditions. Now, if we use this inertial solution as an, an initial um, solution for optimization, we get much better um, results. So this is what you see for stir up. It's also, it's not only um, has a high fidelity, it's also robust to changes in systems parameters. So this is what we see for stir up. And then we used it to perform um, some other algorithms. OK, so let me move on to the second example. And the second example I want to show you is how we use this inertial stirrup to perform fast uh, quantum logic gates. So specifically, we chose to implement geometric gates. In a geometric logic gate, what you do is you take your system. And again, once again, you slowly um, change the Hamiltonian, but you do it in a cyclic manner. So you start from some point in parameter space. You change the parameters. You get back to the same point. And when you do that, and as long as your system is in the dark state, it's a zero energy state, your state acquires a geometric phase. And you can basically make this phase implement a unitary. You can tra translate the, the, the acquired phase determines a unitary transformation on the qubit. So this is in words. And now let's give a be more a specific. So such gates can be implemented in, in these um, four level um, for lever energy scheme. So this is called a tripod label because it's a little tripod level atom because it looks like a, a tripod. Okay. So let's say take atoms that have a, some four, three um, low lying energy levels and an excited level, for example, hyperfine states in rubidium. Um, and then you use these four levels in three fields. Now, two of the states are, are our qubit levels, and then two in E are some additional fields that we use to implement the protocol. So the protocol, this geometric protocol, works in the following way. You initialize some qubit state here, and then you do two steps. You transition out of the qubit manifold into the state 2, and then you come back from 2 into the qubit manifold, but you come back in a different way. Okay? So if you go one way, but you return in, along a different path, you acquire a geometric phase, basically. And, and to be more precise, let me give you a simple example of a Pauli Z gate. So in a Pauli Z gate, you basically only transfer the population of the one state into two. And then when you go back, um, you go along a different path. And you can look if you uh, imagine the state of the qubit in the one, two subspace. You start from the population in one, you go into two, and then you come back into one along a different path, and these um, trajectories enclose a phase. And that phase translates into a relative phase of the state one relative to zero. So that's a Pauli Z gate. And now, how can we use what I just showed you? So what I showed you before is that we have an inertial stirrup protocol. We know how to go from one to two via E in a very um, rapid and robust manner. So we just do this step and that step like going here and going here, 
using our inertial protocol, and we have an inertial gate. Okay, so that's what we did here. And, and these are results, but they're very similar to what you've just seen. <laughs> so this is, um, again, the infidelity as a function of protocol duration of a standard Gaussian pulse, this sine square pulse in our inertial, so this analytic solution of the conditions on the theta. And for a Pauli Z gate, for a Hadamard gate, this is, these are the, the field profiles. So we basically, in a Pauli Z gate, we modify the phase of the second field in the last stair up step. And the Hadamard gate is a little bit more complicated, but basically it works, okay? Okay, so that's protocol number two. Yes, Lisma? Yes, Lisma? Okay, so protocol number three. I have many protocols here, so I will stop when the time ends. Not that many, but, but here's another one. So um, this is a um, slightly different. So we're, again, trying to look for an optimized version of a known adiabatic protocol. And the adiabatic protocol here is teleportation. So in adiabatic teleportation, it's very similar to, so I, we kind of all know teleportation, but this adiabatic teleportation is a little bit less familiar. But the, the setup is the same. We have Alice and Bob. Alice want, uh, wants to transfer a state to Bob. She has two qubits, he has a single qubit, and the initial state is that she initializes her state, her Q1 in the state she wants to transfer, and then qubits two and three, uh, she shares a Bell state with Bob. Okay, so this is the beginning, and now the protocol is as follows. Um, Alice and Bob turn on some entangling interaction between their qubits, two and three, and then they turn it, I mean, they're already entangled, by the, but they turn on this entangling interaction, then they turn it off, and they turn on, uh, and Alice, Alex <laughs> turns on an entangling interaction between qubits one and two, and magically, Bob gets psi. So why does this magic happen? And so here's the, the answer. So. Uh, specifically, H1, the first Hamiltonian, is an XX plus ZZ interaction between qubits 2 and 3. And H2 is the similar thing. It's an XX plus, Z, plus ZZ interaction between qubits 1 and 2. So in order to understand why um, this works, I mean, it's exactly a diabatic following of a ground state. And, and to, to understand that, let's just say the following uh, fact. So H1, if you look at it closely, it has a two-dimensional ground state manifold. That is, as long as qubits two and three are in the phi plus state, uh, you see sigma one, so, so the Pauli operators of the first qubit don't even appear here, so any qubit state that Alice prepares is in the ground state of the Hamiltonian as long as the st initial state of two and three is phi plus. And the situation is similar for um, H2. So here, basically, as long as phi one, two is in a Bell state, then any state of qubit three is in the ground state. So by adiabatic, so this may convince you that by starting in the right ground state and doing things slowly, the system gets what, where you want it to get. So why am I showing you this? Because I want to explain to you how we construct an inertial protocol. So to see that, um, I want to introduce one other bit of uh, literature, and that is that we can define uh, new operators we call them logic, uh, cu logical qubits, but they're, they're just a new set of operators. And when you write down the Hamiltonian now with this new set of operators, um, let's see what you get. So we introduce basically the, the first logical qubit is you know a product combination of uh, all three Paulis. Uh, the second logical qubit is like a product of uh, qubits two and three. And then the third logical qubit is in some sense a product of the Pauli operators of one and two. And what happens is that our ham original Hamiltonian that involved H1 and H2 um, that had terms of interacting spins, it turns out into this. And what you see here is that we have only sigma x2, sigma z3, so we have non-interacting operators, okay? Why is this good? It's good because we know how to solve. We know how to find an inertial solution to a non-interacting spin problem, right? So the first thing I showed you um, that Roni and Roy found in this inertial theorem paper is how to write down an analytic solution to um, a single spin in a rapidly changing uh, field. So if we know that, we know a single qubit, we can solve you know, a single uh, two but non-interacting logical qubits. And if we know that, we can solve the interacting spins. 
And the reason why this is important, I think, is because in larger, larger systems of involving many interacting spins can be mapped sometimes into non-interacting logical qubits. And we know how to solve them in a way that we know how to guess a good a starting point for optimization of an adiabatic protocol. So this is the point of that. But now, how many minutes do I have? Two, three. Two, three. <coughs> good, great. So I will skip. <laughs> because two minutes is enough to conclude, I think, and to thank the collaborators. OK. <coughs> yeah, I had one more thing to say, but it's a similar, in a similar spirit. So what I tried to convince to you, at you, is that inertia protocols are a great choice for implementing adiabatic protocols. So unfortunately, all the protocols I showed you were also adiabatic. They were inertial, but they satisfied the adiabatic conditions. But still, they performed better than just, um, you know, just uh, trying to, up to, to optimize without having a clue. So, um, so this is what I, I was trying to show you, that inertial solutions are, her are helpful for optimization and are good initial guesses. Our hope is uh, bigger than that. We hope that basically optimized inertial solutions and maybe even non-adiabatic ones uh, can solve large hard problems. So if you remember the uh, problem that I introduced uh, in the beginning, the problem of adiabatic algorithms is that um, they need to be adiabatic, they need to be slow, but maybe uh, we can get rid of that. And there, so, so there are other works, for example, there's a recent work uh, from a Mulmer, Klaus Mulmer, uh, with the same idea of this inertial evolution. Basically, he says that if you perform STA, this is shortcut to adiabaticity, but in the inertial frame, you can find solutions that are non-adiabatic but are inertial. Hopefully, maybe, um, this can produce um, algorithms that are actually um, very efficient. OK, so with that, let me conclude and thank the people who did this work. Um, my students, uh, Daniel, who did the optimization work, Yuval, who is doing, working on the teleportation, and Jonathan, the, working on the part that I skipped. So uh, he's working on how to generate the lar large cluster states in entangled, and in general, entangled states that are um, useful for, for metrology. So what we do there, we also do optimal control, but we optimize directly the Fisher information, and we find pretty useful things. Uh, using similar ideas, and I would also like to thank Roni and Rui, who um, came up with the idea of inertial evolution and our great collaborators, and Barak Dayan, my former advisor, who got me started working on Stirup. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee.